Hello, welcome back to How to Read a Poem. Now the poem I'm going to do now is again a bit obscure, a bit abstract. You might read it the first time around and go, what in the world is the poem getting at? What is the subject matter of the poem? Now we'll unravel this, we'll go through this together. It's called The Bat and it's by the poet Alan Brian Vaughn. Now it takes as a starting point a simple domestic scene and then something intrudes, the bat intrudes, and then there's a sort of reaction against the bat. Now, of course, it's not a poem purely about a nighttime invasion of a bat. It's about something more. What is it? We'll get to it. So let's pay attention to the language at the start and the atmosphere it paints. So reading in bed, we might say the speaker is a parent enjoying the, enjoying the mundane act of domestic bliss, reading in bed, Everything's peaceful, everything's calm. We are secure in our domestic space, full of sentiment for the mal evening. So I'm full of positive emotion. I'm full of happy feelings towards the mal evening. Now look at the word mild and how it sort of sets the scene, the atmosphere, the whole mood. Everything's placid, everything's calm, everything's all right with the world. So we get a sense of ease with the lines. The poem eases us in into the domestic environment that it's trying to convey to us. And the children are asleep in adjacent rooms. So the children are packed away. It's the time, that time of the night where we relax, where we let our guard down, where we think everything's all right with the world. So we are kind of winding down to prepare ourselves for the next day. So the children are asleep in adjacent rooms, hearing them cry out now and then, the brief reports of sufficient imagination. Now here, this is sort of almost flowery way to indicate the fact that they are having nightmares, right? And, and maybe nightmares might seem to us to be a traumatic event. It might seem to the children, you know, who are experiencing those nightmares to be a sort of unwelcome event. But the perspective is from the parent and therefore the perspective is detached. So I'm hearing the children cry out now and then, but I'm not responding to their cries because I know what they're dreaming, I know they're having nightmares and so therefore what they're experiencing isn't real. So we have the brief reports of sufficient imagination. Sufficient and not excessive, the implication is such. So sufficient imagination, the world of the imagination is contained. It's just sleep, it's just nightmares, it isn't reality. So think about all these ideas and now let's prepare for the scene change. Now prepare for something unwelcome intruding in. So we get that atmosphere, we get that perspective, and we get a report on events. It's almost dispassionate. It's a tone of peace, it's a tone of quiet. And listening at the same time compassionately to the scrabble of claws, the fast treble in the chimney. So in the chimney, the speaker hears some sort of scrabble of claws and he hears compassionately, it might be a bird trapped in the chimney. So therefore, we have that attitude of compassion because, you know, we understand a bird is trapped in the chimney. It's kind of struggling to get out and so I can respond in that way. It's a poem enlivened by the sense of sound. So I'm hearing the cries of the children. I'm also hearing the scrabble of claws, which I think it's a bird, the fast treble in the chimney. And then we get a very harsh line break. The hyphen emphasizes it. Then it was out. So think about that, right? The entity is described as it. It's not a bird. It's not a trap bird. Re expectations are overturned. Something comes at the speaker. It was out. It rushes to the speaker. It invades the safe space, the domestic environment that was being set up in the previous part of the stanza. Not a trap bird beating at the seams of the ceiling, but a bat lifting towards us falling away. So not a bird. We might think about the speaker's imagination of the bird to be a somewhat peaceful, somewhat nice looking bird, you know, that has kind of unfortunately been trapped in the chimney. So therefore I can respond with compassion, but not when a bat comes flying at us. A bat, of course, being associated with the supernatural, being associated with vampires, being associated with something unwelcome, with something demonic, with something monstrous. It jumps out at us. So we see here the lines between reality and the imagination getting violently blurred here with this almost attack of the bat. So I can't respond with compassion, although a bat and a bird are animals all the same. A bat lifting towards us, 
falling away. So not a bird that has a scrabble of claws, but a bat that comes towards us, that invades our safe space, and it falls away. So think about the atmosphere, how it changes from the start of the poem to the end of this stanza. So the bat comes. How do we deal with the bat? And now the poem shifts into very indirect mode. It gives us two lines of italics. Again, the emphasis is on how do I, a human being, respond to something of that nature. Think about the sufficient imagination of the children. There the speaker can remain detached because the speaker understands the line between imagination and reality is sufficiently drawn. So how do I respond to this incident? Something that takes me unexpectedly, something that overwhelms me. You might think about what is the draw of horror movies. We go into horror movies in order to experience that sensation of the unknown that overwhelms us, that gives us all these powerful feelings. So how does the human being respond? Dominion over every living thing, large brain, a choice of weapons. Now think about this like dominion over every living thing. You are studying Western literature, I tell my students all the time, you need to know your Bible because that forms the literary cornerstone of so much of Western literature. So here we might hear an allusion to Genesis because in Genesis, the Lord God, the Creator, gives Adam and Eve dominion over every living thing. They are made in the image of God and so therefore they are entrusted to be stewards of the animals. But here, it's not stewardship that's emphasized, but dominion over every living thing. Dominion, we might hear that uncomfortable idea of domination. So how do I assert my control over an unexpected reality? First response, dominion. I'm a human being, I am blessed with a rational mind. And here you might think of the earlier poem, Mind by Richard Wilbur. In that poem, it suggests the difference between the human being and the animal and the bat it's the same animal in both poems, is that the human mind is superior to the working of the bat. So here, this idea is invoked, but of course this idea is invoked here as a way to cope with a reality that seems to the speaker to be overwhelming, that seems to the speaker to just suddenly come out and become horrific to that extent. So, dominion over every living thing. The human being has dominion over an irrational animal like the bat. So that's the first response. Large brain, second response. As with the Richard Wilbur poem, we see the speaker here emphasizing the human being's large brain, i.e. the human being is more intelligent, i.e. the human being is more sensible. The human being should be able to overcome what the bat presents to him or to her, a choice of weapons. Failing that, there's always the use of physical force. There's always the use of the weapons in order to chase the bat away. The tone here isn't that control. The speaker is responding in whatever way he finds necessary in order to cope with that flying in of the bat. So again, we have this relationship between the human being and the natural world. What is the human being's response to what he or she sees in the natural world? So shuddering in the lit hall, we swung repeatedly against the rising secular face. So we shudder, we have that visceral response, we have that emotional reaction against the bat. Whereas in a couple of lines earlier, we've asserted dominion over every living thing, a large brain. So those intellectual responses aren't really working. So what did we do? In the lit hall, we swung repeatedly against the rising secular face. We use a weapon and we swing against it repeatedly. We, we might think of its ineffectiveness, the bats flying all over the place. There's the last ditch effort to chase the bat away. We swung repeatedly against, or note the interesting nature of this next line, its rising secular face. Now, of course, secular, that word means something that is opposed to religion something that doesn't belong in the realm of religion. So the bat is, in this instance, given a sort of monstrous feature about it. It has a face. It is personified to a certain extent, but it's a rising secular face. It's something that we cannot classify. It's something that we cannot control. It's something that seems completely alien, threatening, monstrous to us. So what is our first response to that? It is to bat it away. It is to chase it away. Again, so now the poem addresses deeper questions about how do we relate to something that's alien to us, to something that challenges 
our assumptions about good and evil, reality and the imagination using the figure of the bat. So the rising secular face, something that's other, something that's completely alien until it fell. So this contrast between rising and falling. So we've succeeded in chasing the bat away, then shoveled it into the yard for the cat. Not only chase the bat away, but also kill it. So the bat may not, in a sense, intend any harm towards the human beings here, towards the mother and father, but we've done it excessive violence because of our emotional response. And here we might think about this idea of nature invading into the man-made environment. So here, the bat is seen as a transgressor. The bat is seen as something that invades. So we need to get rid of it. So we shovel it into the yard for the cat. Now here, the figure of the cat. The cat, of course, a domesticated animal. Now think about this idea here. The bat is completely undomesticated. The bat belongs outside. The bat belongs to the wild. The bat belongs to the realm of the demonic, the monstrous, the supernatural. Whereas the cat is domesticated. So we've domesticated the cat, but the final line of the poem suggests that things are not that simple. So for the cat who presumably eats the bat, but the cat who also shuttles easily between two worlds. Now the two worlds of the poem that it's important to note, the human being keeps separate. The world of the house and the world of the outside. The world of the human and the world of the animal. The human being who is intelligent, who is rational, and the animal who is instinctive, who is irrational. The animal who just obeys whatever nature has programmed into it. So the poem might be suggesting the more the human being tries to keep these two worlds apart, the more an incident might shatter that fragile distinction between the two worlds. And here we have, as a conclusion of the poem, the cat who retains some sort of the domestic about it, but also retains the animal about it. The cat who gobbles up, who devours the bat. So the poem, although difficult, I think it's rewarding because of the things it suggests about what makes us human and by extension, what is not human. What is the safe space of the home and what is outside? And what happens when something upsets that balance? When something shows us how we human beings are actually fragile, insecure, rely on those distinctions to keep our sense of identity intact? This is How to Read a Poem. Thank you.